Deliver us, deliver us, O oh Yahweh, hear our cry. And gather us beneath your wings tonight. Greetings, my friends in Christ from St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Jonesville, Indiana as well as all of our online guests who are joining us. It is good to have you with us now for part five of our study of Exodus. Today we will be talking about Moses going to Mount Sinai and receiving the Ten Commandments. Certainly a, an important moment in the life of Moses, in the life of Israel. Uh, this is something that besides the actual parting of the Red Sea and the actual Exodus, is probably the most significant event in the book of Exodus. Now, as we get into the Ten Commandments, I just want to make this disclaimer. For this particular study, I do not intend to go through each individual commandment and, and talk about the meaning and the implications of each individual commandment. Uh, perhaps we will do a, another study on that sometime in the near future, uh, but if you would like something more on each individual commandment, I certainly commend to you Martin Luther's small and large catechisms on the Ten Commandments. A uh, large catechism especially is just uh, extremely rich in pointing out the implications for us on each commandment. And even though it was written 500 years ago, it is always amazing just how timely uh, Martin Luther's explanations are. And so I certainly commend those readings to you if you would like more on the individual commandments. But today we are just going to talk about uh, specifically Mount Sinai and its significance here, as well as the general implications of the law in general. Uh, as the Ten Commandments are kind of the embodiment of God's law to his people, uh, so also then we will talk about what is the role of God's law and how does God communicate that law in the giving of the Ten Commandments? So let's get right into it. We start at um, Exodus chapter 19, and then we will also read chapter 20. I will give you a minute to review those chapters real quick. Exodus chapters 19 and 20. So there we have Exodus chapters 19 and 20 leading us into uh, what this, this whole um, study of the Ten Commandments is going to be about. Uh, and it starts off by Israel going to Mount Sinai. Now perhaps you would remember from a previous video that God had told Moses this, that they would be returning to Mount Sinai. At that time was called Mount Horeb. But you remember in Exodus chapter 3, God said... I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And so this is fulfilled now. God has brought his people out of Egypt through the Exodus, through the parting of the Red Sea, and now he brings Moses to serve God and for God to serve his people uh, on this same mountain, on Mount Sinai. Uh, Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai are the same mountain. They are geographically in the same place. Uh, they are the exact same mountain that God spoke to Moses on previously. And, you know, here we have God speaking to Moses in a cloud, um, not a burning bush this time, but once again, this presence of God, which speaks to his prophet, uh, is to be taken as the second person of the Trinity, as the Son of God, as Jesus Christ before he was incarnate. The pre-incarnate Son is speaking to Moses now, and uh, that, is, that is the God who gives Moses his message. And so we have in chapter 19, God saying, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. It always goes back to Egypt. It always goes back to what I did to the Egyptians, how I freed you out of Egypt, right? 
how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my, my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And so uh, God invites these people of his, these chosen people, as he has already rescued them, he has already freed them, he has done the work of their freedom. Now, after he has freed them, now he says, if you will be my people, this, this will be our covenant. Uh, this will be how we, um, how we contractually agree in, in relationship to one another. Um, I will be your God and you will be my people. And this is what you will do to show that you are my people. So that's really kind of the preface to the Ten Commandments. Uh, before he invites Moses up to receive the commandments, uh, he, he tells the people to wash their garments. Um, there is certainly an implication here that uh, connects us with baptism, right? A washing that makes us prepared to stand in the presence of God. Um, and certainly baptism makes us prepared to stand in the presence of God without fear because the righteousness of Christ is now our clothing. And then also uh, there is this constant message of uh, wait until the third day. The third day the Lord will appear. Um, and it is on that third day then that God appears to Moses, that he gives him the message that he is to bring to the people. And likewise, it is on the third day that Jesus appears Jesus appears to the women. He appears to his disciples. On the third day, Jesus rose from the dead and gives his disciples the message that they are to bring to the people. So once again, anytime we see this third day uh, mentioned, it is usually pointing us to remember another third day, the third day of the resurrection of Christ, when Jesus uh, conquered sin, death, and the power of the devil and rose victorious and gave us that message to proclaim that he is risen, he is risen indeed, alleluia. So once again, we're not going to go into each of the Ten Commandments and their specific meanings, but uh, let us get into Exodus chapter 20 and talk about the Ten Commandments. First of all, uh, we should note that when we talk about the Ten Commandments, uh, this is something everybody understands. Everybody seems to have a, a knowledge of the Ten Commandments. You know, we go through uh, these constant battles over whether the Ten Commandments should be displayed in our courthouses and in our public buildings, in our schools, all these kinds of things. Um, everybody has a cultural knowledge of the Ten Commandments. Uh, it is interesting then to point out that uh, the phrase Ten Commandments appears nowhere in scripture. There is nothing in scripture that says um, we have 10 commandments. We have commandments. Uh, we certainly have the law and that law was written on tablets of stone, but nowhere in scripture does it say the 10 commandments. This is uh, something that has been learned by teaching over time. And uh, you know, we have this kind of cultural awareness of but that does not say in Scripture, these are the Ten Commandments. So I just want to kind of point that out because uh, it is interesting in the Hebrew and in the Jewish tradition uh, regarding these Ten Commandments, uh, they, they refer to them as the Ten Words. Okay, And it's not just the words of law, but it starts with the very first word, the first word in the Hebraism, of uh, the, the ten words, the first word is that uh, verse 2, where God says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That is the first word. Okay, it's not a commandment. It is a word. It is a uh, proclamation from God, reminding the people who he is and what he has done for them. Uh, and then we get into the actual commandments, what we would call the Ten Commandments. Um, to note here, 
that these commandments, even though all of Christendom, all Christians agree that there are ten, there are different ways of numbering them. In the Roman Catholic and the Lutheran tradition, we usually talk about the Ten Commandments as being two tables, right? Uh, two tables of the law, and this is certainly uh, valid. We usually uh, refer to the two tables of the law because there are the two tablets of the law. It says very specifically in Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, He gave to Moses... Uh, when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Okay, So he didn't give Moses a scroll. He didn't send Moses an email. He gave him two tablets of stone on which God himself, with his finger, wrote these laws. And so we have this idea of two tablets of stone. And then uh, we also... Uh, in, in Matthew chapter 22, we have this idea of two tables of the law, all right? So perhaps on one tablet was one table and on the other tablet, the other table. The two tables of the law uh, we get from uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And so we have this idea of uh, the first table of the law being to love God, uh, how we show our love for God. Uh, we show our love for God by not having any other gods. We show our love for God by not misusing his name. We show our love for God by remembering the Sabbath day and keeping it holy. That is what we would say is the first table of the law. And then the second table of the law has to do with the love of our neighbor, how we love our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, we are called to love our parents. Um, we are called to love uh, all of our neighbors by not hurting them, by not harming them, certainly by not killing them. Uh, we are uh, told to love our spouse uh, in the Sixth Commandment by not committing adultery, um, by not stealing from our neighbors, by not uh, bearing false witness or false, false testimony against our neighbors, or by not coveting our neighbors' things, right? Uh, all of these things have to do with loving our neighbors. So love God, love your neighbor. These are the two tables of the law. Now, it shows us then that... Uh, in, in all of the commandments, um, we are called to love others, right? It is, it is a calling to serve somebody outside of myself, whether that is uh, the calling to serve God in the first commandments, the first three commandments, or in the, uh, uh, the love of neighbor, which is the last seven. Now, I say the last three and the last seven because I am a Lutheran, okay? Uh, Lutherans and Roman Catholics, probably not coincidentally, Lutherans get much of what we get from the Roman Catholics. Uh, we prefer to number our commandments in this way. Uh, the first three commandments, uh, have no other gods, do not misuse God's name, and remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. That's what we call the first three commandments. Uh, in the Reformed and uh, Eastern Orthodox tradition, they would... Uh, take the first commandment, you shall have no other gods, and then they would also then include in that, um, you shall not have any graven images. Do not make for yourself any graven images. Now, certainly that is what Exodus 20 says, and we do not want to discount those words of Scripture. We just kind of include that in the first commandment, right? To not worship another god means that we are not going to worship an idol or a carved graven image to that idol, right? We just combine that all into one commandment. Uh, but we could certainly separate it, and that's not a big deal, unless the implication of that is to say you can't have, for instance, a picture of a cross, right? And that's when we would say, no, absolutely. The, the, the cross, the crucifix, that is something that we should not only be allowed to have in the church, but we should have in the church as it reminds us of what Christ has done for us. 
Um, so we never want to say, we, we never want to take that too far. But certainly we shouldn't worship idols. We are, we are in agreement on that. Um, and then where we differ on the tail end, you know, we, we would divide the ninth and the ten commandment, tenth commandment by saying, you know, you shall not covet your neighbor's house and you shall not covet your neighbor's uh, wife, maidservant, manservant, ox or donkey, anything that belongs to your neighbor. Um, we separate those two, whereas the Reformed and Eastern Orthodox would combine those as one commandment, do not covet. Um, I will say neither counting is necessarily right or wrong. Um, really, it, it kind of goes to show what I started with by saying it really never says there are ten commandments. That's something that uh, our history of teaching has has shown us, but it's not something that the Word of God says. Uh, so you could very easily say there are nine commandments if you uh, just combine them all, or you could say there are 11 commandments if you want to separate them all. Um, it does not say anywhere that there are 10, and the Lutheran way of counting them versus the Reformed way of counting them, one is not necessarily right and one is not necessarily wrong. Uh, it is just the way that our traditions have have come to understand the commandments. Now, you could take this graven images thing too far and say there should not be any, any artwork in the church. There should be no stained glass windows. There should be no statues. There should be no banners. There should be no artwork in the church. And if you take it to that point, then I think... Uh, I think we do have a problem because I think you've taken it too far and you've put a law on things that there ought not be a law on. So something like my cross, my crucifix here, uh, there should be no law against that. That should be something that, that we want to see, to be reminded of our Lord's suffering. Um, and to just kind of point out why that is, why that is the case, uh, to say that there should be no images... Um, in regards to worship, certainly we should not worship the images. The golden calf shows us that. We're not quite there yet, but we'll get to that. Uh, but, but images in and of themselves are not bad, even golden images. And we see this uh, in Exodus chapter 25, just after God gives the, the Ten Commandments. He is giving them instructions on how to build the tabernacle. And uh, he talks about making these curtains. Um, and as he's making, talking about the curtains, he says, And you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. Okay? So as he's talking about making these curtains, he's talking about what kind of fabric they are to use. And then he says, sewn into this fabric... I want you to sew images of cherubim, of angels, uh, into it uh, to, sh to show that this is a holy place, a holy place where angels dwell, right? Um, and then also in Exodus 25, as he is talking about the Ark of the Covenant, he says, And you shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work shall you make them. On, and so that's graven images, right? On the two ends of the mercy seat, make one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. And so just after God says you shall have no graven images, now he is telling the people how to make graven images, how they are to make artwork to uh, adorn the tabernacle, to decorate the tabernacle. So I think it's a far stretch to say that artwork in and of itself is the problem. No, it is the worship of these images, of these um, statues, or uh, the worship of, these, um, the, of, of this art, right? That is what the problem is. And uh, every other religion at this time would have that. Every other religion would go to an image or a statue uh, to be the object of their worship. We see that with the golden calf. Uh, but God says, I do not want you to worship an image. I want you to worship me. right? And that's why we say that goes along with that first commandment. Uh, you shall have no other gods. Interestingly, then, in Colossians chapter 1, 
Paul is talking about Jesus Christ himself, and he says, uh, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, right? So in the person of Jesus, we don't need a statue to worship uh, because that's what God might look like. Rather, we have the human being, the man, Jesus Christ. He is the object of our worship. He is the one uh, whom we adore, whom we serve. That is the God above all gods. Um, that is the God that we worship and serve. And so uh, in Jesus, we have the image of the invisible God. And so that is some of the difference in the, uh, in the numbering of the commandments. Um, it's really not a big difference. Like I said, I don't even care if we call them the Ten Commandments. They can be just the commandments or the law. Uh, we can call it that and be perfectly fine, be perfectly well within Scripture. Scripture never calls, its, uh, calls these the Ten Commandments. That is something we use as a, as a, a bit of a teaching device, you might say. Um, the commandments show us that life as the Lord's people will be a life not about self-improvement or self-betterment, but it is a life of relationship and service to others. Uh, if we look at this in comparison to um, other religions, perhaps, you know, we look at Islam. Islam has the five pillars of Islam. And I would say four of those five are really all about the self. Okay, the four pillars are um, fasting, uh, prayer, uh, giving alms, uh, almsgiving, uh, a pilgrimage, or what they call a hajj to, Me to Mecca, um, and also then their confession of faith. Um, there is um, no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. That is their confession of faith. Um, really, I would say four of those five things do nothing to help others. They are strictly about your personal relationship, in this case, with Allah, your personal relationship with God. Um, it is not about you serving others. Now, maybe almsgiving, depending on where those uh, alms then end up going, those could be to the benefit of others, uh, but that's not necessarily entirely clear either. Um, Four of the five, at least, though, are really about self-improvement, about bettering my relationship with God that really has nothing to do with my neighbor. Um, in modern culture, you know, we might hear a lot of uh, self-improvement tips, a lot of self-help, you know, the, the things that we do to keep ourselves healthy. Brush your teeth, exercise, eat well, quit smoking, um, prevent forest fires, you know, these things all are are good um but they are they are not necessarily good for for all preventing forest fires is good for all uh i, I d that was just silly but uh you know if you quit smoking that's good for you it's not necessarily good for others um maybe secondhand smoke right uh, eating well that's good for you exercise is good for you brushing your teeth is good for you that's all self-help that's all self-improvement that does not have anything to do with love of your neighbor the Ten Commandments are all about being outside of us, right? The Ten Commandments are either about serving a God who is outside of us or about serving our neighbor who is outside of us. Uh, the Ten Commandments have very little to do with how we take care of ourselves or how we serve ourselves. And so that is, that is what we have with the Ten Commandments. We have God telling us that as his people, as his covenant people, we will live for others. We will serve others. And in doing that, uh, we will show that we are his people. Now, it is interesting that the Ten Commandments start with this preface where God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God is the God who, who rescues his people, right? And then as rescued people, he says, this is what I want you to do. It, it is not, uh, we don't want to put the cart before the horse and say, if you keep these commandments, then God will rescue you, then God will free you. God has rescued you, he has freed you, and now these are the things that, that are his will uh, for your life. Um, we, we could get this very wrong by saying, if I keep the Ten Commandments, then I am saved. No, what God says is, I have saved you, 
now keep my Ten Commandments, okay? And we also have to realize the reason for the giving of the Ten Commandments uh, is to show people how to live, right? It is to act as a guide uh, to his people, but it is also to act as a mirror, okay? And this is the role of the law for each of us, right? The, the role of the law is to shine as a mirror before us, and as we look at those Ten Commandments, we see that we have not kept them perfectly. We see that, uh, that we, we have sinned both against God and against neighbor. And uh, the role of the law in general is to bring us to repentance. It is to bring us not to Mount Sinai, but to bring us to uh, the mountain of Calvary, to bring us to the cross and to say, uh, Lord Jesus, uh, for these sins you have died. And therefore, we lay those sins at the feet of Jesus, and we let him forgive us of those sins. Uh, the law is there to bring us to repentance and to bring us to the mountain of Calvary, right? So we have two mountains going on, Mount Sinai and Mount Calvary. Uh, certainly, we have um, the presence of God on both mountains. We have um, inclement weather conditions at both mountains, right? You've got the thunder and the lightning at Mount Sinai. You have the darkness and the earthquake at Mount Calvary upon Jesus' death. Um, but we see here in these two mountains, one mountain of law and one mountain of gospel. And it is certainly the gospel mountain, the mountain of Calvary and Jesus' death on the cross. That is the mountain which saves. Mount Sinai is there to shine a light on our sin, to shine a light on our sinfulness and our need for repentance. And then Mount Calvary is there to offer us the forgiveness of sins and the righteousness of Christ that comes from his death and resurrection. And so that is certainly not everything I want to say about the Ten Commandments. That is all um, we have time for today. I hope it was illuminating for you. I hope you learned something about the Ten Commandments and certainly, once again, I commend to you to read uh, Luther's meanings in the small and large catechism about the Ten Commandments. And uh, uh, I, I think you will find those to be completely relevant for us today. God's blessings on your week. Have a good one. So, Lord, let your judgment, let it pass over us. Lord, let your 